right, good afternoon, welcome. We're gonna go ahead and get started, it's 2.32. We like to respect those of you that come on time. <laughs> And our job is to get you out on time. My name's Jennifer Thronson. I'm the Pre-K-12 Literacy and Library Media Coordinator here at the State Board. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so sweet. I have fans. It's great. <laughs> um, my colleague here to my right is Sarah Whipke. She's our K-3 Literacy Specialist. Then moving back to our um, USBE kind of corner over here, we've got Liz Williams standing up. She's our Kindergarten Specialist here at the office. Whitney Barlow, el uh, Elementary Math Specialist in Assessment. Then we have our ELA Specialist in Assessment. This is... Um, well, my mind's blinking. Thanks, Heather. <laughs> it's 2.30. I've been going since 7.30 this morning. <laughs> back to back to back. Heather Gross, she's lovely. She really, you should know her name because she's going to come in handy when you have questions on the keep because she's one of your go-to people. And then Tracy Gooley is up in special education and also focuses on assessment. So that is your USBE team of support today. We will wander around when there's opportunities for you to talk at your tables and be able to answer questions more in a small group level, then the whole group, it'll help facilitate a, a quicker meeting. On your way in, hopefully you signed in on the sign-in sheets. That'll give you that kind of check that you attended today. And then you should have grabbed two manuals. You have a really thick one that you should get some good bicep muscles from, which is the Keep Teacher Manual. It's much thicker than the entry was. Um, and then you have the exit student materials. So hopefully if you have those two pieces. Our goals today are really to take you through so that you feel confident in answering questions or administering the test, depending on your role. So if you are a district leader or kind of going to be helping others give the test, if you'll raise your hand just so we can get a feel of the atmosphere. If you are the person who's going to be giving the test on a frequent basis to 60 children, okay. <laughs> so a good mix of you in the room. So we'll try and kind of hit both perspectives, uh, whether you're the ones just kind of helping to support versus the ones actually administering the test. So. Overview of the agenda, we're going to review um, a couple of the key purposes of the KEEP. They are in your manual. There's six of them, but there's two that we really want to kind of reinforce with the exit. Uh, logistics, how to kind of get set up to give the test. There are some things you have to prepare in advance um, to be ready to sit down with a kindergarten student. And we have tested this on children um, last spring as well as in January. We did kind of middle of the year kindergartners, which gave us kind of like, huh. They're doing pretty good at middle of year and where we'll be by the end of the year. Uh, we'll review the questions. We'll go question by question pretty quickly. There's no videos. This is a much shorter training than the, the one that you attended in the summer um, because we feel like the format's very similar. It's really just getting you to the really particular fine points of some of the questions. And then we'll uh, touch on the accommodations portion. So with given that, just the reviewing of the purpose in your teacher's administration manual, if you want to kind of walk along with me, uh, we have certain components that you'll kind of see throughout the book. And so in the very kind of opening pages on page seven, you have the six main purposes of the KEEP assessment as in general in terms of entry and exit. Uh, but for this particular piece, we thought we'd focus on two just to kind of reiterate why we're doing what we're doing because sometimes change is hard and we forget that there's a good purpose behind the change. <laughs> um, so specifically the two that we really are gonna see the best benefits from and we do present to the legislature in the fall. So we'll use this data to help start communicating the story of the impact for this first one. So understanding the influence and impact of full day kindergarten. Um, we talked about this with the entry. That's a huge piece for many of our kindergartners who get the added benefit of a full day. Um, but we don't have the data to support that that's really working. Uh, this test we anticipate will kind of give us that data source so we can clearly communicate the impact of full day kinder and hopefully raise the dollars being spent in that area. As well as kind of that data formed decision making. For kindergarten, when you go from entry to exit, you can kind of see where your gaps are. Where in our instruction are we weak? Um, we saw that with the preschool, you know, where are our preschool programs kind of weak coming in to keep entry? We've been able to kind of share and communicate that with preschools to really say, hey, phonemic awareness and phonics, not so great. It's our lowest category in every school district. Um, we need to do a better job in preparing in that area. So it's going to kind of guide some of that work for you as well, probably as kindergarten teachers, but also district professionals. Where can we give more resources, energy, professional learning around to kind of support these critical skills? Okay. And remember, the test is not comprehensive. It does not cover every standard. They are the standards that are most predictive of future academic achievement. So in terms of, is this going to cover your whole core? Absolutely not. It's not the intention of this assessment. It's really to say, if the kids have these skills, it's highly predictive they will continue to be successful in school. So let's kind of move into the next page. I think this is on page um, seven as well, kind of just moving down from the purpose to the start time kind of structure and setting. So first of all, this is still required to be um, provided by a certified teacher trained on the KEEP. 
So whether that training, if you're here today, this is your training. If you're training via our webinar on Monday, that's your training. If you're training on the recording from any of those sessions, um, just really making sure people have kind of the, the nuts and bolts. And then there is small group and individual administration. Most of the items are individual, but there are two small group items that we'll go over um, that you're expected to do that in a small group setting at the small group table. Um, and we'll kind of go into some more detail around that. The testing window, we get this question a lot, so just kind of mark your calendar. <laughs> it's the last four weeks of kindergarten. That's going to vary depending on your school or your district. When your school gets out, you count four weeks back from that, and that is your testing window. The data has to be entered unless you're a year-round school. We have a different date for you um, into the data gateway by June 15th. If you're year-round, we have four, I think, elementaries that are year-round. They have till June 30th. Okay, and you'll be entering it in the data gateway, and you will be relieved when you see the data gateway today. <laughs> it will be a much easier experience for you compared to your um, entry experience. I hope you'll be kind of uh, satisfied with the new look. Administration time, like I said, we've been administering the test to a variety of students, um, kind of with those 13 scorable items, which is your literacy and numeracy portions, and then your eight observational questions, which is that social emotional questionnaire piece that you don't actually submit to us. Approximately about 20 minutes for individual um, questions for that individual sitting, um, and then another 20 minutes for the small group. You're welcome to break up the small group and do part of it one day and part of it the next day. That's fine. But the individual test needs to be administered in its entirety in one sitting. Again, for standardization. If, unless they have an accommodation that says otherwise, all kids should be receiving that whole test in one sitting. Uh, the small group, though, you can kind of maybe the first week of the window, you give the phonics piece. And the second week, you give the writing piece. That's fine. However, it works for your schedule. That part's flexible. But the one-on-one -on -one administration needs to be done in its entirety. Okay, and then preparation. I don't like that that end. See, that's why I don't like Google. <laughs> I apologize for the end. Um, really, just in preparation, you're going to be you know, a couple of months before you probably even give this assessment, or at least a month out. Um, come back to the manual, refresh yourselves. I mean, we spent months with this thing. We have some of them memorized in our minds at this point, but most of you have not had that lovely opportunity. So take the time to refresh. And if you can, I would probably schedule a student who is highly proficient the first time through just to make it easier on you because they don't need as much prompting. You don't have to think about the discontinue rules. You just get a little more flow. And then maybe invite some of your other students that you know this might be a little more painful for <laughs> and kind of have that experience. So totally up to you how you run it, but it's nice to get familiar with the rules. Um, work with your administrators and parents to schedule uh, testing. There's going to be lots of different models for that. We're going to go through that here in just a moment, minute. Um, so thinking about there's not one approach that's going to fit, but it depends on your LEA, depends on funding and such. And then the last one, the testing materials. So there's quite a few with this particular test, so I'm, we want to go through those. So on, yeah, I told you, lots of tools. Page eight, <laughs> um, you have the test administration booklet and the student booklet, so check. Like, we're ready. We have those two tools in front of us. The next one is the copy of the scoring sheet, which is in the back of your manual, manual in the appendix. It's in the teacher piece. You'll want to either copy that for each student, or you can just do it online via the data gateway. Most of you are like, if it's like last time, I'm going to do it on paper and enter it later. But you haven't seen the new version. So I think I will convince many of you to convert to technology with this experience. But you can tell me if I'm a liar later, OK? <laughs> um, so optional in terms of whether you need paper or if you want to actually just do it digitally online and enter it um, straight there. Then you've got your pencil and blank sheet of paper. So each student, when you're testing, will need a blank sheet of paper and a pencil. They'll need a set of 10 basic counting manipulatives, whatever you choose, similar to the entry, whatever is kind of typical in your classrooms. You're going to need the little set of text for question number five. And I think I have a little example, and we'll show these to you again later. But there's three little books that you'll have to cut apart and make into little books. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Um, but once you have one set, you just need one set for the whole testing cycle. You don't need one per kit. So it's just one quick iteration. Um, writing paper, this is also in your appendix. There is a two-sided, so it's meant to be copied so the kids, if they write really long, can just flip the paper over and keep going. Um, so that's that experience for that copy for number seven. And then there is an option for 9, 11, and 12. You either need to copy the appendix pages, such as this one, 
Or you can copy one and then you can put it in a sheet protector and just let the kids use a dry erase marker and erase. So that's how I did it when I went out and tested. Just so I didn't have to copy as much. It was really fast. I erased it. We went to the next kid. So totally up to you how you do it. Um, but 9, 11, and 12 all allow the student to draw or write on the sheet. And so if you want to have a paper copy, you can. Or if you just want to have the dry erase and score and erase, uh, that's an option too. I'm, I kill a lot of trees for lots of other purposes, but for this one, I was really reserved. <laughs> okay, And then privacy dividers. This is for the small group items, because you're going to have a small group of kids. I used to call them offices. You might call them cubicles. Whatever you call that privacy divider that allows kids not to see each other's work, and that will be required for number six and seven. Because when you're saying, you know, write this word, all the kid has to do is look at his neighbor, and that's not an effective teaching or you know testing practice. So make sure you have some way of dividing the kids up so they can't see each other's work. Okay, it's quite a few pieces of preparation. We're going to stop there. Let you kind of talk at your tables about some of this work. I want to just kind of think about the this particular piece. When you're thinking about how you might test individual, there's lots of different ways to do this. You could do one or two kids a day and just take a kid when you have that kind of small group time and replace one of your rotations with a testing time and kind of work your kids through that way. You can take the last few days of school, depending on your LEA, if that's what they choose, um, and test and not have kids actually come for instruction. You could pay and get a sub. There is no money for that from the state, so I'm not encouraging it, but you could <laughs> get a sub to test so that you can get this done in a few days. Um, so there's options there. What's the other option? There's one more. Like I know we had four. That I already said that one. Let me check, because we came up with a few different models. Oh, a testing team. There is an LEA that I'm aware of that's doing a testing team that's going to go out that is certified educators and going to test the students. So there's different ways. But some of them cost money and other ones are free, depending on how you orchestrate it. So just thinking within your own LEA. Um, the small group, we just recommend during that small group rotation time you already have, to take one of those sessions to do this the small group administration. Doesn't need to be on top of, but just in lieu of probably for that particular day. And um, this writing portion goes up to 15 minutes, and then the phonics portion is five minutes. So together they make 20. So it's totally up to you. None of my kids took 15 minutes to do the writing. Some of yours might be really verbose. Most of my kids were like, and I am done. <laughs> but it was middle of the year kindergarten too. So they might go a little longer by the end of the year than what we experienced in January. So some things to kind of talk about at your tables, especially around how you might go about the administration of the exam. So go ahead and just chat for a few moments about the things we've covered so far, and then we'll take you into the actual items. All right, let's go ahead and wrap up our conversations, please, if you could. And we'll come back together as a group. Thank you. So we're going to be talking about the literacy overview. And after we talk about, I'll wait. Oh. Four, three, thank you. Uh, right? Kindergarten people know. Um, so with the literacy overview is what we're going to go over next. So that's just going to be the literacy items, which are the first half of the test. And then we'll be talking about the numeracy items. So with the literacy items, you'll notice they're a little bit different from the beginning of the year, probably because obviously the entry assessment was based on the preschool standards, and this is based on kindergarten standards. So you will notice that the standards are different. So the first one, listening comprehension. We're going to go through all these um, one by one, just so you are aware of that. But the first one is listening comprehension. So talking about those things, we also include some speaking and listening standards in that one as well. Then we have phonemic awareness. And you'll notice there are two questions on that. The first one is talking about the initial, medial, and final sounds. And we'll be talking about kind of some of the vocabulary in there. And then phonemic awareness for number three is segmentation and substitution together as one. Number four, we have phonics and word recognition. And so that's very similar. We have some, we have five. Um, CBC words, and then we have five nonsense or made-up uh, words. Number five, the emergent reading. Jen showed you those little books that we'll be using. Those are the three little books. And then number six and number seven, encoding and writing. Those are the ones that are small group administration. So those are the ones that you won't be doing one-on-one. -on -one. The rest of these are all one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and with the encoding, you're saying words and they're writing them. And at the end, there's a sentence that they're going to write for you. It's very brief. It's only three words. And then the writing piece is actual writing from you will give them, you will be reading them a text actually twice, and then they'll be writing about one of the animals from that text.
Do I have to be close? Oh. Thank you. Now it's working. OK. So you'll notice in your book on page 12 is where listening comprehension begins. It looks like this. So in that one, kind of like the last assessment, you'll notice we have the question at the top and what it is. And then we have the content area, the standards it's aligned to. New for the end or for the exit assessment is grouping for administration. The reason it's new is because at the beginning, everything was individual one-on-one. -on -one. There wasn't any small group. But because this one has small group, that is a piece to watch out for that is new. And then we have the instructions. And again, you just read aloud the script in bold, just as you did at the beginning of the year. And then we have scoring. And then you'll notice on the next page, we have the purple, which is the accommodate instructions, and then the materials and sample record of response, which are helpful when you're giving the assessment. So when thinking about these things, I kind of pointed out, because I don't want to go over every little thing, since all of you were probably trained on the entry, and it's very similar, I don't want to give you um, too much time, and we won't have the videos. So when we're thinking about this specific question. You're going to be reading a story about Antonio's walk, and then they're going to be listening carefully because they have to answer some questions at the end. So you'll read through that story, and then you're going to pause and say, now I'm going to ask you about the story. And in a complete sentence, tell me, how did Antonio know it was spring? So you'll notice there's kind of two pieces there at the bottom of the instructions. If the student does not answer in a complete sentence, because we know that can happen, you would say this to the student, start your sentence with, Antonio found, and then say your turn. So you're kind of giving them a stem to start with. Um, if you have a student who doesn't give you at least two examples, you can prompt them by asking, what else did he see, or, see hear, or feel? Now with the scoring, you'll notice there's kind of two pieces to the scoring. We have oral, and then we have listening comprehension. So with the oral language responses, and remember, this isn't really based on the quality of their response necessarily as far as accurate examples. That's more in the comprehension piece. So they have two points if they answer in a complete sentence without the prompt. One point if it's provided with a sentence starter, but it's still a complete sentence. And then a zero point if they have words or phrases and no complete sentence. The listening comprehension is a little bit different. That's out of four points. So you can answer with at least two accurate examples of signs of spring from the story without prompting. So that's how they get all four points. And then it kind of goes down from there to zero. So you'll notice we also give those examples of warm weather, or colorful flowers. Those are all from the story about Antonio. Below that, you have the accommodate instructions for students who are deaf or hard of hearing or students who are nonverbal. And then the materials and sample record of response. So since this is the first one, I'm going to have you just briefly, for about one minute, discuss this at your table. And we'll be around for questions. And then we'll move on and we'll group some questions together instead of going one by one. So we have about 20 more seconds. All right, let's come back together in five, four, three. All right. So if you turn to page 14 and 15, we have question two, which is the first one on phonemic awareness. We have initial, medial, and final sounds. You'll notice on the top, just under the instructions bar, the blue bar, it says the teacher may use a position term that the students are familiar with, such as beginning, initial, or first. Or when you're talking about middle, it could be medial or middle. And then the same thing with final, ending, or last. So you'll, need, you'll notice that little asterisk. Um, let me see. I kind of highlighted it so I could show you. But they have the little asterisk by the word, so that if, for some reason, you aren't using the word first, you're using beginning in your class, that's fine. So the teacher does have discretion to use the word that they are already using with instruction so that it's not tricking the students and they're not answering it because it's a vocabulary issue. So do know that. That is also on question number three as well, so I'll bring it up then. Um, be sure to use normal speech when giving the words. No intonation should be given to the sounds. I'm sure you, you, you're laughing because you're like, we've all heard that people do that. Um, <laughs> so and when you <laughs> read the directions, it's listen to the word mat. The first sound in mat is mm. And so you'll notice we also put a little note right here. So when you see that M with the, the symbols, you'll say the sound mm in case there are any teachers who maybe are a little bit unfamiliar with that symbol. We added that in as well. So that might be helpful. Um, so and then you say, what's the first sound? And you pause. Um, now I want you to tell me the first sound you hear in these words. You give the words, 
If the student says the letter name or says all the sounds, you can prompt just one time, just say the first sound. And again, you'll notice that asterisk is there again, just in case they want to use beginning or initial or whatever word works best. There is a discontinue rule. If the student does not isolate any of the first sounds correctly, then discontinue and move to question three. Obviously, medial and final sounds are more difficult. And so if they can't do the first sound, it's pretty unlikely that they're going to be successful with the rest of it. And so rather than wasting your time and, and building their frustration, we did put that discontinue rule in there for you. And then you'd go on. It's the same, same question for them. It's just now we go to last sounds, and then we go to middle sounds. The scoring is just one point for each correct sound, so it's pretty simple. Um, the, students may not, or the question may not be applicable for students who are deaf or hard of hearing. So being mindful of that, they might skip it. Um, and then there are instructions for students who are nonverbal. And then, of course, there are no materials for this one. And then you'll have the sample record of response in the box. Question number three, also phonemic awareness, which is on page 16 and 17. We have phonemes segmentation substitution. So with this one, again, it's that same position term. So if you see that asterisk and they want to use a different uh, word for that, that's fine. Instead of saying final, maybe they want to say last or, or whatever. Um, students are allowed to tap out sounds or some other action as long as it isn't coached or encouraged by the teacher. So I know oftentimes when we're doing these kinds of activities, the students are used to tapping it out or doing something with their hands or arms. That's fine if they do that unprompted, but the teacher can't be prompting them to do those things. So just kind of being aware of that. So it's listen to me as I say all the sounds in the word dog, and you would say dog. Uh, now you say all the sounds in dog, and you're pausing. Now I will change the last sound g to a t. Now I will say the new word. The new word is dot. So then you have item, that's just a practice. Then you have item one and item two. So now it's your turn. You say all the sounds in the word map. They should say all the sounds. Um, and then now change the last sound to p, or from p to an n. What's the new word? And so you're going through that. And it's the same thing for item two. So with this one, there's one point for each correctly segmented sound in map, which is out of three points. And then one point for saying the new word man, when they actually switch that ending sound. And then one point for all of the sounds segmented in bun, which is out of three points. And then one point for saying the new word bug. And there are no materials for this. And then you'll also see in the sample record of response what we're meaning by the words and the sounds. Yes. No. No, great question. And in case you didn't hear her, she was saying when I'm doing the word and I'm used to doing a certain um, hand motion with it, um, that you cannot be doing that during the administration. It's just saying those things. We're doing anything in italics, but since that's not in italics for standardization, we need everyone to do it the same. So we are not including those actions. Thanks for asking that, Angie. I appreciate it. And then question four. This is phonics and word recognition. So when we're looking at this one, you'll probably be fairly familiar with this. It's not that different from what we do with, with Dibbles. This one does have an actual student sheet. So if you turn in your student manual, you'll notice this sheet looks like this. And gum is the actual sample. So you'll display the student material sheet for question. And it says 4A. The reason for that is because halfway through this question, you'll go to 4B. Um, and that's where the nonsense words comes in. The reason we did that is when we went out and tested kids and we didn't have them separated, we didn't get the instructions read and they all just started doing what, we're like, oh wait, I didn't read that part yet, just wait. Because um, you know, they're just so eager and excited. So listen as I read the word gum and you'll move your finger quickly underneath it. Um, gum. I can also say each sound when I read it like this and then you'll notice after that it says, say the sounds continuously without pausing between them. So you would say g um, gum. Does that make sense? So you're not separating them out individually with a pause in between. Um, and then you'll say, now it's your turn. Read some words. Try to, mm -hmm. Try to read the whole word. If you can't read the whole word, say each sound first, and then read the word. And then you're pointing, and they should be getting with those sound words. Yes. Say that again. Oh, you would? OK, sorry. I didn't hear you. But Jen says yes. So <laughs> she heard you. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. So you're not just, instead of doing g, uh, <laughs> not doing that. So that's, that's a pause between. You're just, you're saying each sound, but you're not pausing in between. So that's the continuous piece. Yep, that's a great question. Thanks for that. Um, and then, of course, halfway through, you would turn the page in the student materials booklet to these nonsense words, and you would say, now read some words that are made up, and you point to the first word. Try to read the whole word. If you can't read the whole word, say each sound first, and then read the word. Oh, yeah. Sure. You. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. We want them to stop barking sounds and actually blending the words. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yep. No, I'm glad that you reiterate that. That's wonderful. Um, you'll notice at the bottom, just above the discontinue rule, it says, if the student doesn't know a sound. Wait three seconds, then point to the next sound and prompt the student to continue. So if that happens, if they just kind of freeze for a bit. There is a discontinue rule. If the student does not know any sounds in the first five words, so those are the CVC words, the real words, then you would discontinue rule, right? If they can't do those, it's pretty unlikely they're going to be able to do it on the next five. The scoring. So notice the scoring is a little different on this one. There's one point for each correct letter sound, so that's 31 total. And one point for blending the word correctly or they get two points for reading the word correctly without blending. So if they can just read the words just as we would be able to, Kaj, Yiv, Tem, Hox, Lun, if they can just do that, they get the two points. If they have to segment and then blend, they only get the one point for getting that, that blend. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So. Those three questions, number two, number three, and number four, we're going to give you a little time to discuss at your tables, and we'll be around to answer any other questions, if you have any at that time. All right, let's wrap up our conversations in 10 seconds, please. Five, four, three. Thank you. Um, and I just want to point out, if I go back, oh, it's not on that page. So on page 19, you'll notice in the sample record of response, let's see if I can hold all of these at once. It would be so tricky. Um, You'll notice it says CLS, which is the correct letter sounds. They're out of 31. It's because the one sound zips, or the one that word ha zips has an S on the end. That's why it has 31, because you're like, 5, 10, that's not 31. Um, and then the whole word's read is out of 20, because if they, if they read each one without sounding them out, then they get the two points instead of the one. So that kind of helps distinguish in the scoring. So that picture might be a little more helpful. All right. So question number five, emergent reading, that's where you have to have these books. Remember, you only need one set of the books created, and they are in the back of your TAM. And the TAM, just because I might forget to tell you what those are, it's this. It's the, the test administration manual. So in case you're like, what is she talking about, this TAM thing? That's what it is. Um, <laughs> so when you're looking at that, we have these three books. The first one has the dog. So. If the student at any time pauses for more than three seconds, then provide them the word and have them keep reading. If a student makes the same error multiple times, then mark it wrong each time. So you'll notice the first book, the dog sits, the dog jumps, the dog walks, the dog. So if they get dog wrong every time, it does count as an error every time. Um, yep, question? Oh, on number four? Yep, yeah, okay. Sure. So I guess there's one sound. Mm -hmm. but... Oh. So, for example, they got, it's that second row, the middle word, tem. So they said the sounds correctly, t, eh, 
Mm, but when they went to blend the word, they said Tim. So they didn't get the correct word on the for the whole words read, but they got the sounds for that word. Is that what you're looking at? <laughs> Get rot or catch. Well, I got rot. But they got three of them. Catch. Here, eight, four of them. Sorry, that's eight, and then this is now. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Yep. So if you look at um, wag, uh, cub, fed, and give. Two. Same thing with cub and fed and give. I agree. I think it's easier if you score it. Separate. Oh, Liz, do you want so people can hear you? It's easier if you score it separately. You think go through and mark it as they're reading the words, but then when you calculate the score, count just the correct letter sounds first, and then go back and calculate the whole word read separately. So for scoring nine points on whole word read, they read wag for two points. They didn't get any points for rot because they just segmented. They never blended the sounds. If we're scoring whole word reds, they didn't get any whole word red points for that. They got two points for cub, two points for fed, no points for zips because they dropped the beginning sound. So I Because they read the whole word, but incorrectly. So just to clarify, to make sure you heard Sarah, they read the whole word, so that's why they got the red line underneath. The mark through the beginning sound is because they either omitted the sound or gave the wrong sound, so they didn't read it correctly. They would get three letter sounds for I, P, and S, but none for the whole word read. Does that help? Does that, okay, all right. So the nine came from Wag, cub, fed, and give. Those are each two points, and two times four is eight. And then the other one they got was lun. They got one. But they had to blend first, so they only got one point. Mm -hmm. Yep. Good. Yeah, it is much easier, yeah. Does that help? Is anyone still? Nope. OK. OK. So turning back to um, emergency number five. So text number one, which is the dog book. And you can print these double-sided from pages um, in the back of the TAM, this stuck in this book. Um, page 58 through 63 are the actual booklet stories. So you'll place the first text in front of the student. You'll say, read this story out loud. I will ask you about it when you are done reading. The student reads. After the student reads, remove the text. So you're taking the book away from them. And ask the following questions. What is the story about? What can the dog do? So obviously, you're asking one at a time, giving them time to respond. To proceed, the student needs to read text one with three or fewer errors and answer at least one of the comprehension questions correctly. If those aren't accomplished, then you discontinue and you would score items two and three as zeros. So, yep, exactly. Thanks for re reiterating that. And yep, she's exactly right. And in case you didn't hear her, she said if they read dog, for example, because it's in that book four times, if they read it wrong every time it is an error. Mm -hmm. um, you'll notice, and it's the same process for text two and text three. Um, text two, they need to read with three or fewer errors and answer at least one question. And then text three, obviously, if they get to that point, they're going to be reading it. Um, the scoring. So if you look at the scoring, you'll notice on page 21, it's a little bit different than you might think. So the reading errors are out of 12 points total for all three books. 
They get four points on each book if there are no errors when they read them. Three points if they have one error, two points if they have two to three errors, one point if they have four to five errors, and zero points if they have more than five. Then the reading comprehension piece, and this would be out of six points total because of the three books, two points if they answer both questions correctly, one point if they answer one of the two questions correctly, and then of course zero if they don't answer any of them correctly. And if you notice on page 22, it actually has a sample record of response, so that might help solidify that, those scoring pieces as well. So we did actually insert the text into the scoring sheet just for ease of scoring, because when we did, it wasn't in there. And we're like, I have to write this in every time. That's annoying. <laughs> yes. Yep, it's about things in the grass. Yep. So the whole book isn't about a ladybug, right? So they should be recognizing what is the, the gist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they'll still get to move on. OK, any other questions on that one? I think we're probably, oh, one more, yes. If they say it right, yep. Yep, I, I had a kid that said something different every single time. I was like, oh, OK. If they self-correct within the three seconds, that's fine. Yep. All right, number seven or six, just kidding. OK, so I'm just going to put a quick note on six. You might want to put like a little star or a post-it or something on number six, because number six is where we start small group administration. So. When you're actually giving this assessment, you would go through one through five. You would skip and turn the pages for six and seven, because you're going to do those at a later, later time, because they're small group. Then you would do seven and the rest of the assessment before doing the small group. Because the small group, maybe you might be doing it two days before you're giving the individual assessment, or maybe after, but you're not giving it at the same time. So just a quick note, you would normally do one through five, skip six and seven, because that's small group administration, and then do eight and the rest of the assessment. Clear? Good? It's a very important piece. <laughs> All right. With number seven, you're going to distribute lined paper of your choice. I know some people have very, it's got to be exactly this lined paper. Great. Uh, whatever you use, a pencil and privacy divider for each student. So again, this is where you're putting those privacy dividers out so that they're not you know, cheating and looking at the next student's work. Um, so you're going to say, write the words I say in the lines. Try and write all the sounds you hear. And say them at a normal talking rate. And, and again, we added that in there because you've all heard people say, they'd be like, the first word is pan. They'd be like, pan. And you're like, no, just say them normal. Um, so <laughs> the first word is pan. And then you'll say, say it with me. And the kids will say, pan with you. We cook food in a pan. Write the word pan on the first line. So they're writing the word pan. Then you go through with the, the next two words. And then you'd say, now you'll write a sentence. Write the sentence I say on the next line. The sentence is, Jim is wet. Say it with me. Jim is wet. Write the sentence, Jim is wet on the next line. You'll also notice it says, repeat the sentence as many times as needed. Because we know some kids need that. And they're like, what, what was that last word again? Um, so you, and, and again, making sure you're saying that sentence at a normal talking rate, not Jim is, not, not like that, just normal talking rate, yes. Yep, they're supposed to. Yep. Say it with me. Jim is wet. Yep. For scoring, it's one point for each sound spelled correctly, which is out of 17 total with the three words and the three words in the sentence. One point for each whole word spelled correctly. That's out of six. And then one point for a capital letter for the word Jim, because it's at the beginning of a sentence and it's a name. So they should be doing that piece as well. And again, that's any writing, lined writing paper or whatever that you so choose. If you want to use the writing paper that we use for question number seven, if you want to use the back of that sheet, that's fine too. That's always an option. If you don't have any already printed out, that's absolutely fine. Number seven, this is the other one that's small group. So 
You'll notice it says with the group administration, a small group, it also says maximum time allotted for each group is 15 minutes. So at the end of 15 minutes, the writing is complete. Um, so use the pages in the student materials booklet for question seven to administer this item. I am going to let you know that um, unfortunately the copies for this were not what they should have been. Um, if, you, if you got the electronic version of it, you'll notice it says double side on the short side. They double sided on the long side. So now unfortunately, what was supposed to happen, so let's all pretend it's, it really happened, is the kids are looking at the picture and the teacher is reading these because they're normally not upside down. So some of you might be excellent readers at upside down text, which is great. Um, but just know this is being fixed, yes. So, so we appreciate your, your patience in, in this. Um, <laughs> but knowing this, it says, so I, I'll do my best to read upside down. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing. So I'm going to read you some interesting information about animals. Listen carefully. And then it goes on to read the rest of it. And then as your words finish, you'll notice that you're flipping to the next page. And you'd be reading on the back while the student is looking at the next one. You're flipping again. And eventually you get to the picture that looks like this. So once you get to this one, it's all these animals have special skin coverings and body parts that make them different. And so once you get to this page, then you would go to, now that we have read about animal bodies, your job is to choose an animal, a fish, a bird, a bat, or a dog, and to write about its body. And you'd point to the pictures to remind them these are the ones we're talking about, right? Um, this is the bird, you know. Um, I'm going to read the text one more time. So they've already heard it once. You're going to read it again, which means, of course, you'll have to flip back, right? Um, <laughs> And be the, so that you can think about what you might want to include in your writing. So then you'll flip back, read the story again as you're flipping so they can see the pictures. Once you get to this page again, you'd say, now it's time to write about the animal you choose, a fish, a bird, a bat, and a dog, and, and to write about its body. I'm going to read the, t oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Make sure to include many details about the animal's body in your writing and drawing. And remember to use a capital letter at the beginning of each sentence and leave spaces between the words. Remember to write before you draw, you may begin. Now in there, you'll notice it said to use this paper. So this is the one you're using. It's on page 65 and continues on page 66 in your TAM. Or sorry, this is the student materials one. The heavy one, the TAM. Um, so when you're copying it, you can copy double-sided. So if you, if you have students that can go beyond this page, great. They can just flip it over to the back. So we did provide that for you as well. Um, you'll notice it says at the bottom, as the students work, teachers can repeat as necessary. Remember to write and draw about the animal you chose and include details about that animal's body. If the student starts drawing first, because you we've all, right, everyone's seen that. Um, and you know that will be 40 minutes before you rip that out of it, right? Um, you can say only once. Remember, you need to write first, and then you can draw. So you are able to give them that prompt. And then there's more information on page 27 on the top, right up here. Teachers should not provide a word bank. And if a student asks for help, you can say, do the best you can. Do not spell words for the students or use a sentence starter or sentence stems. When the student indicates that he or she is finished, use the one-time prompt, looks good. Can you add any more details? Once the student has done their best attempt, a teacher can ask the student to tell them what they wrote and record the student's response to clarify the writing if needed. And remember, this question shall only take up to 15 minutes. So that piece is kind of for the dictation because we've all, most kindergarten teachers are pretty great at being like, this says whatever. But sometimes you're like, I have no idea. That's where that part comes into hand. And this is also why it's small group because if you're doing that whole group, that would be really tricky. Um, the scoring, there's uh, three different parts. And I just a quick note, spelling is not scored on this one. OK, so that was on the last one, the encoding piece. Score, the spelling isn't scored on this. I'll get to you in just a, just a moment, I promise. I, I, did, I, I didn't forget you. Um, the topic and details part for scoring. So the details may include information from their background knowledge. That's OK if they include that. So they have four points if the response includes one of the animals from the text and at least three details about the animals chosen. And all the ideas are connected to the animal chosen. Three points would be, of course, one to two details. And it continues on to zero. Capitalization, they get two points if they use a capital letter for the words at the beginning of sentences or a sentence, depending on how much they write. One point if it's kind of inconsistent. You've all seen some of that. And then zero if they don't use any capitals. And then for production. So 
They get five points if the student respond, response is in writing and includes a drawing that matches their writing. Four points if they respond um, if they respond in writing but doesn't include a drawing that supports their writing. Three points if they use a combination of that dictation that we just talked about briefly and writing or drawing. Two points if the student draws or dictates their response to the teacher and it relates to one of the items from the text. One point if they draw or dictate their response to the teacher. However, it doesn't relate to one of the animals from the text, because you've all seen that as well. And zero points if the student responds or doesn't respond. They don't have any response for that piece. And then did I answer your question or not yet? OK. Um, the one sheet is supposed to be the one that they're seeing. They don't see the writing. Is that what you're talking about? Or the text, I mean? You won't have to read it upside down. We're fixing it. Yeah, so you don't have to worry about that. Yep. Yep. Yes, absolutely. Because we recognize that's a big issue. Um, <laughs> so we'll go ahead and fix that. I think what we're going to do is pause and we'll, because it seems like there's a lot of questions, and we'll respond to it. Just raise your hand so you, we know that you have a question. But they have to be what's in the text? Well, it can be. Or, it, or, it, 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 All right, let's come back together in five, four, three, two. Thank you. So we had lots of questions about the timing, the 15 minutes. So the 15 minutes doesn't include the stories being read twice. It's just the writing time. So the 15 minutes is just the writing time. So maybe make a little note of that. Like, we probably weren't explicit enough, obviously, if we had lots of people questioning. So whoever's taking notes, write that down, please. <laughs> we need to be more explicit with that. But so version 2.0 uh, will have that little piece on the 15 minutes is just for the writing piece, not the reading of the story. So just for your, just for your knowledge. Good questions. All right. So anything else regarding literacy before we move into the numeracy piece? Great. OK. So we have oral counting. So we're talking about that. It's a little bit different from the beginning, but it's scored similar to the entry. So that won't be too bad. Counting objects, and then identifying and comparing numerals. So they'll be looking at that piece. Decomposing numbers, compose and decompose T numbers. I know that sounds very similar, but it'll make sense when we show you. And then addition and subtraction word problems at the very end. So if we turn to page 30, maybe, there we go. Um, if you turn to page 30, so the instructions are start counting at 12 and count by ones until I tell you to stop. So instead of having you count all the way to 100, because I know you super love doing that, we're just having start at 12 and count by ones until I tell you to stop. Now, when they get to 21, you can tell them to stop, OK? Um, Record any errors on the scoring sheet. Now start counting at 83 and count by ones until I tell you to stop. And once they hit 100, then you tell them to stop. Now, when we were giving this assessment, which was really fun, they did a lot of interesting things. So we tried to put some information there for you in case you get some of those interesting things as well. So if a student skip counts, say count by ones. So if you have a kid you know, going 12, 14, 16, or whatever thing they could be doing, if the student does not count out loud, Go ahead and say, count out loud. Um, you laugh, but it happened. We're like, oh, I can't say anything. We need a prompt. Um, if the student starts at 1, repeat the directions, because they probably didn't quite catch that you said start at 12. Um, if the student starts at 12 and counts backwards, which you, you would not 
believe how often that happened to me. Um, if the student starts at 12 and count backwards, say start at 12 and count forward. <laughs> Um, and if after giving one of the corrective prompts and the student still can't complete the task, go ahead and just say stop and continue on to the next part. So um, the scoring is very similar. If you actually look on page 31, I think it explains it very well. It's just like the beginning where they count and then as soon as they make an error, that's where their points end. So this student in general said 12, 13, and then they made an error at 14. Maybe they said 12, 13, 13, because you've all heard kids say that. Um, they get the two points for that. And then below, they counted 83 to 93 without errors, so they got 11 more points on that piece. So just like we did at the beginning of the year. Maybe. There we go. OK. So oh, oh, I'm so sorry. There we go. Counting objects. On page 32, you'll display the student material sheet. It looks like this. So again, you can make copies of this, like Jen mentioned at the beginning, or you can just put in a sheet protector like I did. I just put this part has two, two pieces, so I put both in the same one so I can just flip it when we're done. Um, but it looks like this. So you'll display that student material sheet and provide the student with either a blank piece of paper and a pencil, or you can put it and then place it in the sheet protector and use a marker. Either way is fine. So you'll say count the circles. Allow the student to count. Tell me how many circles there are. Allow them to do that. Um, and then now write the number. So that's what they're doing. And they can write right on there. That's fine. And then you, yep, that's what most of the kids did. They just, yep. And some of them didn't even mark it. They just did it with their fingers, which is fine too. They don't have to mark it. Um, and then you display the triangle side. Jen, if you want to flip that. So let's count the triangles. Tell me how many triangles there are. Now write the number. You'll notice right here it says, if the student does not count out loud, again, go ahead and say, count out loud, because you have no idea what they're doing, and they might just be guessing 16, or maybe you forgot to erase it from the last kid, and you're like, rats. Um, <laughs> so go ahead and have, have them count out loud. So the scoring, it's very similar to what we did at the beginning of the year. So that it was not as clear as we have it now. So hopefully this is better. Please give us some feedback if you're like, nope, still terrible. Um, <laughs> at the bottom of page 32, it says for each number, there's a 16 and the 9. Counting in one-to-one -one correspondence. So they get two points if the student counts the number of objects correctly and uses one-to-one -one correspondence. And that's why, yeah, that's why we have to count out loud. Now, one point, if the student counts the number of objects correctly without using one-to-one -one correspondence, or the student uses one-to-one -one correspondence with errors in counting. So they said 50, they counted 15 instead of 16, or they counted 17 instead of 16. So we tried to make that a little bit more clear. Then if you turn to page 33, that's where the zero points comes in. The student is unable to count the number of objects correctly, nor uses one-to-one -one correspondence. Then we have the cardinality piece. It's one point if the student correctly tells you how many there are without recounting the objects. So it's that tricky piece where, again, if they did count 15, they should say 15. Because if they say some other weird number, that's going to be weird because they counted 15. So it does have to be the amount that they counted. Writing the numeral, the student writes the number that corresponds with his or her response. Tell me how many there are. So again, if they counted 15, that's it. they should be writing 15. The student, now this is kind of a key point, you might want to highlight this. The student may or may not point to objects in the images as they count. They may or may not. They might use the marker. It's hard to say. Um, reversals are accepted. So for example, if they write a 9 backwards, however, transposals are not accepted. So if they write 61 instead of 16, that's not correct. So if it's backwards, yes. If it's a transposal, transposal no. So kind of keep that in mind. That's a big piece you probably want to hit on when you're training. Um, that might be helpful. Number 10, identifying and comparing numerals. So you have, we're turning to page 34 and 35, in your student materials manual after that, you have the picture for number 10. It looks like this. Yep. Yes.
Well, they can't count their head. They do have to count out loud. But I mean, they might not they're, point they're to them. Yes. Yep, yep, or they counted one extra or one less, you know, kids do that a lot. So, so if they go, they're counting, they get one. They get one. No, they get one point. They'd get one point because the student uses one to one with errors and counting. So they get one point. Right. And it does say if the student does not count out loud, you can say count out loud because he's not. Right. Yep. We just want to make sure they're really doing it and didn't just guess. Yeah. All right. Oh, yes. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yep. That's how many they counted. Yep. Yep. Just like at the beginning of the year. Yep. All right. So number 10. You're looking at this student material sheet. This is what the students will be looking at. So you'd point to the first set of numbers. Let me see if I can hold this. You'd say, tell me the names of these numbers. OK? Hopefully they say 8 and 3. Are these numbers equal? And then, which number is greater? Oh, I'm in the way. Sorry. I forget those cameras are there. Um, sorry for those who watch this and you see the back of my head. So sorry. Um, <laughs> and then you'd go through that with each one. So you're just pointing to the ones, you know, and you're just saying, tell me the names of these numbers, and you're going to the next one, and you're doing all three of those questions. The students might say the number name, or they might point to the number. Either one's fine. So if they're saying, if you say which one is greater, and they just point to it, they don't say it, that's fine. So either one. And of course, reading each one, it's just nine points total. They're getting them all correctly. Comparing the numbers, it's one point for identifying the numbers that are equal or not equal. And then one point for correctly identifying the number that is greater than or less than each number given a pair of numbers. And then if you have um, students who need accommodated versions, there are, it's very similar for nonverbal and verbal, or nonverbal and um, students who are blind or visually impaired and orthopedically impaired, they do have accommodated instructions for this specific one. And then the sample of record of response on page 35 might also help you with an indicator of kind of how it's scored. That one actually was really fun to give. It went really fast and the kids thought it was fun. Um, <laughs> all right, so we're going to walk around with a couple questions. I'm only going to give you about one minute, and then we'll start back up again. All right, let's come back together in five, four, three, two, Thank you. Um, question 11. So we only have three more left. Um, decompose numbers. So this is on page 36 and 37. So for the instructions, you display the student material sheet for question 11. So again, this is one that you can make. You can make a copy of like this, or you can make individual copies. That's up to you and whatever works best for you when you're giving the assessment. But you can do either one. They are also in the back of your, your TAM. To do that, it's on page 69. Um, um, and then provide the students with a collection of five identical counters. So five that are the same. So here are five counters. Separate the five counters into two groups. Allow them time to do that. Write the numbers in the equation to show how you made five. And allow the students to do that. Now show a different way to make five and write the numbers in the equation to show how you made five. So they have to do it two ways. Now, just a quick note, if they make more than two groups, because I had a kid do this, he didn't do it with five, but he did it with eight. Um, if they make two groups, remind them, uh, or if they make three groups for whatever reason, like he made like two, three, and two, if they do that, just remind them, um, you need to only make two groups. So just as a reminder, because 
Then when he tried to write it on here, he was like, just added another plus sign and just he, like he made it work. I'm like, no, that's not really what I'm looking for, friend. Um, so <laughs> you might just have to give them a little guidance on that one little piece. And then it's the same thing for the eight counters. So for this, they get one point for each decomposition with objects. So that's where they're actually doing the decomposition. And then one point for each written equation. So they get one for each. So that's why it's out of four. Mm -hmm. Well, we're asking that they be the same color. I mean, I would guess. Well, they're not if one gets flipped, because then one's red and one's yellow. So as long as they don't get flipped and they're the same color, sure. Mm -hmm. yep. All right. Number 12, compose and decompose teen numbers. So you are, again, actually, and I just put it in the same one. I just put it on the back like I did with the last one. So number 12 looks like this. We have the 10 frames. So when you're looking at that one, you display that sheet. Again, you can use the master copy or make copies, whatever works best for you. Show the number 13 as 10 ones and some more ones by drawing circles in these 10 frames. So they're drawing circles. Um, allow for the student's response. Finish the equation to show 13 as 10 ones and some more ones, and then allow them to do that and re record on the scoring sheet. There is a discontinue rule. If the student is unable to decompose 13, then just move on to question 13. You don't actually have to do the 18 part. So just if they're not able to do the 13, you can go ahead and move on to the next question. Um, if the student writes an equation that does not include 10 ones and some more ones, so for 13, let's say they wrote, they did 7 and 6, um, or 9 and 9, write the equation as 10 ones and some more ones. So you're really wanting them to get it that 10 ones and some more ones. That's why we have teen numbers, right? So that's why we're trying to get it. So if they do the six and seven, give them that little that prompt. So for scoring, they get one point for correctly modeling the number in the 10 frames. So that's where they're drawing those circles. And then one point for correctly writing the equation, blank equals 10 plus whatever number they put in there. So for 13, it would be three. For 18, it would be the eight. And then there are some accommodated instructions. But they should recognize that teens has 10 ones and some more ones. They should be recognizing that, the language from the standards. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, we're just going to have about one minute, and we'll walk around for some questions on these last couple. One minute. Three. Two, one. So question 13. Now, you'll notice question 13 doesn't have any materials in the student materials or anything that you need to make copies of because it's just a blank sheet of paper, a pencil, and some counters. So that's why you don't have to make a copy of anything. I'm going to give you some word problems to solve. Use your fingers, objects, drawings, or equations to show how you solve these problems. So they can use any of those options. So again, you provide them with whatever manipulatives you're using in, in class. Carla has three big apples and four small apples. How many apples does Carla have? And allow them to go through the problem. So I have to tell you, I had a student do this, and he had to draw perfect big apples and perfect small apples. And it took forever. And I was like, oh, I really wish I hadn't let you do that. Um, really wish you would have picked the counters or your fingers. Um, but he just had to make those up, and they were beautiful. I have pictures. They're lovely. Um, <laughs> and then the same thing you're going through with the next problem and the last problem. Um, if the student just states the answer, then ask them to show you how they know with their fingers, objects, a drawing, or an equation to represent. If the student does not begin to solve the problem, say, can you solve this problem? And then repeat the problem as necessary. So it's OK to have to repeat it if you need to several times. There's also a discontinue rule on this one. If the student does not attempt to solve the problem after three prompts, record a score of 0 and proceed to the next word problem. Yes? Well, we can't prompt them on that because of standardization, and it's not in here. But 
you can repeat. <laughs> Remember, <laughs> um, where does it say it? You can use your fingers, objects, drawings, or equations. So let them know we, we've got a variety of ways. It can always be later. Yep. Yep. Um, so the scoring, and this looks tricky because it moves on to the next page. So just kind of know because of spacing, it sort of fell that way. On the bottom, it says scoring three points for each representation created using the rubric. And then the rubric's on the next page. So people are like, where's the rubric? Oh, it's on the next page. So sorry. Um, so they get the full three points if it's an accurate representation. Two points if it's partially accurate, like they were almost there. Um, one point if it's inaccurate, but they at least tried to represent what they were doing. And then zero if they don't even attempt it. Um, so just kind of a note for you, representations may include a verbal response. It might include using fingers. It might be manipulatives. It might be drawing, writing numerals, or even writing an equation. So any of those are, are part of that. And then one point for each correct answer. So that's that other piece that's included in that section. Well, they have to represent it. So if they just answer it, let's see if I can remember where it is. If the student does not, uh, if they state the answer, then ask them to show you how they know what their fingers, objects, drawings, or an equation to represent their thinking. Yep. Yep. So they do have to show you. Yep. They could do that, three and four. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. They have to represent. Oh, does it say verbal on there? Oh, it does say. It does say it could include a verbal response. Yep, it does. Yep. All right. So this is the last one for questions. We're going to walk around and answer any questions. And then after that, we're going to move on to the last little bits. And you're going to be very excited because Jen is going to show you the data gateway, which I'm going to tell you, you'll be so excited when you see that. I promise. It's not going to be like the entry. Be excited, guys. Get ready. Right? <laughs> Thank you. For playing the game. So excited. I owe you some little treat later, Katrina. I just changed the standards at least. Let's come back in five, four, three, two. Come back in one. All right. So on page 43, you'll notice it says when the profile is complete and what you need to do. And you'll notice part of it is that you will continue with the social emotional skills inventory. So that's on pages 44 and 45. Looks like this. <laughs> um, the biggest piece that changed is the standards, because before we were working on the standards from preschool, and now these are kindergarten standards that we pulled. So you'll notice some of them are speaking and listening. We have the, some of the math practice. Um, so that is different. Also, just I'm going to throw it out there. We made a mistake. I know you're all shocked. Um, instructions. It says, after testing the student, complete the social based on their behaviors during the profile. That was the entry instructions. That's wrong. Go ahead and just put a big fat. They screwed up on that, big X. It's supposed to say the last four weeks of kindergarten. So it's based on their behavior the last four weeks of kindergarten. So sorry about that. I do apologize. Um, You'll notice the actual questions, there's eight of them, and they're all exactly the same as the beginning of year. So just kind of a heads up on that. Whoops. Sorry. Sorry. I was excited. All right. Get excited, everyone. It's pretty, it's a good time here. All right. So as at the beginning of the year, you have to go into Data Gateway and enter your data. Um, so within that, it's going to be the exact same website you went to before. And this is actually in the intro pages of your manual. Um, it says data entry um, pieces on page nine, I believe. Yep. <laughs> page nine will have the website of where you go, the datagateway.schools.utah.gov. And when you go there, the new one is not up, so don't get worried. It's, we still have another month before anyone tests, so we're still fine tuning. But it's operational enough for me to show you what it looks like. So um, in terms of just thinking about entering the data, I honestly, to save yourselves time, I would just do the digital piece if you can handle it. If you're like, this is not my world, I'm not a digital person, feel free to paper pencil, but you have to do the hand entry. Um, hand entry is not going to be as beautiful as the digital entry because it's basically you've got to enter all those data points 
after the fact. So you have all that additional time. Where if you're sitting there and listening to the kid and they don't get this letter, you just tap it and then it makes it red and your work is then done and it calculates it all for you so you don't have to do the math. Like it's going to do all the hard heavy lifting. And it's going to say like if they don't make a high enough score on text one when they have to read the book, it's going to skip you to the next question because there's no need for you to be like, oh, do I do the next one or not? The system can do that where we just have it say, oh, they didn't pass, next question. So you might get like, why did it skip it? And you'll have to be like, oh, they didn't score high enough. <laughs> I'm expecting that phone call. Like, I got to text two and it didn't give me text two. What did the kid get? That's why. So just help your friends that get to that point and get frustrated. Like, it didn't give me the next text. It's because the kid didn't score well enough to get that next text. <laughs> um, Local decision around who can enter it, I'm assuming it's going to be very similar to who did it at the beginning of the year um, in your systems. Uh, kindergarten teachers will automatically have access to be able to enter it. Other personnel can be given that access if your school district um, or charter director says so. <laughs> um, let's actually go to the lovely business so you can kind of see what this thing works like. And I guess this one. All right, so this is what the screen will look like. And I have it kind of smaller when it fits on your screen. So it's pretty large when it's sitting just for you. Um, but in terms, it'll have the standard at the top, just like your book. It'll have the scoring in the middle. And then if you want to like look at the directions, although I would probably just have my book by me, but you can actually click on this and it'll open the directions that are in your book. Um, or you can like check, oh, how am I supposed to score this? It's all just within the manual. So it's all there at your fingertips as needed. Our goal is basically when they, you click and click, it doesn't function yet, but this will automatically add up to four. So it'll do all the mathematics for you and just calculate so that you don't have to do that. Um, so that's like question number one, which is that oral language question. And then you can click next, and it'll take you to the next question. Right, right now that doesn't function, but ultimately it will. <laughs> um, and so here, if the kid, you're saying the beginning sounds with Y and V, the kid gets it wrong, you can just tap on it, it'll mark it wrong, and it'll take it off the total points available, okay? And it's, you know, like if you have an iPad device, you can just tap along as you're going, or you can use your mouse on a computer, whatever works. We tried to make this a lot more user-friendly for you as um, people. Yeah, you can just untap, it'll go away, okay? You can go back while you're still in there. If you've submitted the test, then you have to get the permission like you did last year. But if you were like, oh, wait, they did get that, you can go back any time in the test and fix things. Um, but once you submit it, it's that kind of shut down experience like you had last year. We tried. We listened to you all, and we felt we felt bad last fall. So like, I appreciate you surviving, especially those of you that entered 60-some-odd kindergartners. Like, we know it was work. We're hoping this will. those of you willing to try technology will be like, I can do this. <laughs> so here you've got to do each one, right, for map, if they get each sound. M is what, you know, making that new, I think that's supposed to be N. These have to change still, and this will be G. They're still plugging everything in, but we wanted to get like a mock-up so you could kind of see how it works. Red is wrong. So everything in the system is you're marking what's wrong. Um, so same thing, these are not the words yet. They're just placeholders, but just so you can get a feel of what it looks like. Here's the book. Um, we've told them you have to be able to tap those words, so that's going to have to get bigger. So what they're going to do is actually take each of the books and put them on a separate screen so that it's easier to read. All three books is too much. So we were like, just break that out. Future improvements coming. They'll be ready when you guys actually test. <laughs> Exactly. So we're working on how to get that technology. So if I show you, which question is that one? Oh, that's not it. Is it five? Four. Thank you. <laughs> like I haven't memorized them yet. This part they're working a lot on because that's why it's like it's not quite there. Because <laughs> we've got to number one get a bunch of little words in that space and then allow you to tap like whole words versus the yeah. So we've got some different ways we're playing with that right now. They meet with us on Thursday to kind of show us the next iteration. But their goal is March 24th to have it done. So nobody's testing before April 22nd. So it should be done well in advance of what you guys are actually going to see. Uh, but I just wanted you to know we listened and tried to make this easier. It should just be we did a lot of radio buttons when you can just pick things. And if you forget to mark something, it'll be like, whoop. You need to pick something on this page and kind of give you an indication of where you missed something. Um, because sometimes it's hard, 
when you have multiple options for some of these questions. Here's the 803, like what they say. Did they, nope, they thought they were equal. You could just mark around what they got. There's no equal here because they're six and six, so there's nothing to get wrong there, but it all kind of works out the same. So that's probably, I'm just going to skip to the end. This one's radio buttons. Here's the apple question, the banana and the carrot. You do the same thing. Yeah. So basically in this one, when you're in digitally, you can play around with it, but once you hit submit, it'll save that data. But you really, we're going to have a save option to where you can come back for this particular one because you have the small group. So you might be doing this one and need to come back and enter six and seven later. So you can save without submitting now and then go back in and fix as needed or add to. So that will be different this time because of the, the administration procedures. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yep. <laughs> you have till June 15th to enter. So you might say, I'm going to get it all done. And I'm going to enter them all at once. You might be like, well, I'm going to do the digital for the single part. I'm going to enter that number six item today and number seven next week. You can go in. Yep. Correct. Nope. She's got the full four-week window for all your kids. So some of you might do small group. Like, I would get that out of the way, like, before the kids go away, <laughs> and then get my individual testing appointments. That's how most people are going to be operating. But use your time. Don't try and make this just work within. I know it's an assessment, but, like, you have small group time. Hopefully that 15 minutes for that one is close to your small group. It's kind of how we were trying to work that so you didn't have to totally change your schedules. We're trying to make it as nice in your own normal practice as we could so the kids aren't like, this is so different, teacher. <laughs> like, oh, no, we do writing all the time. Like, we can do this. So hopefully that makes you feel a little relieved about what's coming. If you choose to enter it after the fact, it will look prettier, but it's going to be the same thing where you have to go in and mark everything the kid got wrong. It's going to be wrongs instead of rights this time because the score sheet is wrongs. Hence, the system should be wrong. So we are fixing that correlation because last time you marked wrongs, and then in the system you had to mark rights. It was very confusing. <laughs> so we learned from the last experience, your feedback was invaluable for making us better at this um, this time around. Reporting is coming because ex we don't have exit criteria. You're not going to have any reporting. You'll have like the counts, as we did before, which will mean nothing. But counts mean something now. We'll have instant reporting for fall. So when you give the entry in the fall, you'll get an instant score report for that kid. And then as more kids come on, you'll get a class report and a grade level report and all of those things. So just know reporting is getting better. But when you're in an operational field test, you can't tell people, you're proficient or you're not. Like, we don't know. <laughs> so keep that in mind. Uh -huh. Yeah, you can print the screen just like normal um, to be able to get all that data. We're also building out the Excel spreadsheet to where you'd have like a pivot table of what, like, okay, item number 13, who knows cardinality, who didn't. Um, so we're still building that part out through our agency. The programmers aren't responsible for that part. And that way, if you really wanted to see who had S or who read zips and all of that stuff, you'll have that level of detail like you guys wanted in the fall, which we're building right now too. <laughs> so you'll have access to all that. Um, the individual score reports are actually really nice. They're basically going to be clearly transparent to the parent what your kid knew and what they didn't. So it's not going to be like four out of ten. It's going to be like, here's the four they knew, here's the six they didn't. So it's going to be really transparent. So if a parent wants to work on numbers and the kid can only count to three, you don't have to be like, um, let me go back and look. But it's going to be like, they read the three and they didn't know after that. So it'll give the parents a lot. The beginning of year report will also tell the parents what end of year kind of things kids should know because sometimes when you give the preschool entry, they think that's what their kids should know by the end of kinder. Oh, no. <laughs> so we want to be really clear, like, no, they need to count to 100. They need to do these things um, so that it's clear up front so they don't come back thinking, well, I got my kid to pass the entry. Yeah, they should have passed it on entry. <laughs> uh, we have more advanced skills now, right? So we wanted to be really clear. So you'll see that in the parent reports, too, that are coming um, next fall. But your reporting will be instant starting in the fall, not having to wait like you did this year. But we appreciate your patience this year. Depends on your district. So some are going to have it where it'll upload into your like student backpack system, and some you'll have to print, or you could email the report to them and share it that way, whatever works. 
that you share it. Um, we would hope you would share any assessment data, um, but how you share it could be variable in terms of that conversation and what that looks like. But the, if you're attesting a student, it's always nice that the parent gets some. And now that we know what the results mean, like last year, I was like, mm. <laughs> this year, I'm like, you'll be fine. You can share those results. If you have questions that arise when you start giving it, your direct contact, because they're more local and can help you, is your assessment director. If you don't know who that is, you need to find that out. Because when you're like, I don't know the answer to this. The kid just did something really weird. You need to know who to call. If they are not able to answer it, they will reach out to us at the USBE. There are eight of us to field the 1,700 kindergarten teachers. It's not enough capacity, <laughs> OK? So we will field, but the, probably directly from your assessment directors if they don't know the answer. But because they're going to get calls, they're going to know the answer readily for you because they'll get so many of the same thing. So they, the, it's best if you go to them first. We're happy to take your questions if you're not getting a response. But just we always like to um, give you direct contact to your folks. So. Let me give you just a minute to talk with each other, ask any questions of USBE, and then we'll wrap things up. <laughs> Great. Let me bring you back together to wrap this up. Had a great question. Because you attended today, you are now considered trainers of the trainers, right? So you get to train others. You have been deemed that right, OK? So we will send out the PowerPoint link so that you can use that in your own training. We'll send out a recording for this today, so you can be like, just watch it. We do have a webinar on Monday that we'll be recording and sending the link out statewide. There's lots of ways to be trained. But as you probably saw today, there's just a few questions that we feel like it's not just pick up and go, unfortunately. I wish we could make it just like take it and run, but I have not seen the ability to do that with this one yet. Maybe we'll get to that point. Maybe it's our lack of clarity, but I feel like there's just these little things that you're like, but what about? What about this? That if you didn't have a training, you would make up the answers, and those could be good, <laughs> and those could be totally different than somebody else's answer. So in your very back of your TAM are the appendices. The appendices include the accommodations. If you have students that are on IEPs and they have specific accommodations, whether it's an allowable accommodation for this assessment or not. So there's a list of accommodations, but some are not accessible for this particular assessment. So make sure you check that. Just because the kid has an accommodation, if that's not allowable, then you can't use that accommodation. Hopefully in kindergarten, I mean, I think we have 8.3% that are in special education starting the year. So it's not a lot of kids that you're dealing with, but it's some. <laughs> Something to be aware of. Um, so those pages have what's available. Um, in terms of the Braille and large print, those are actually at the printers, and we should have those by the end of the month. So if you have any of those, make sure your assessment person orders those through Tracy um, so that you can have those available for those students that would qualify for that. Oral translation, just a reminder, nothing can be translated. It is a test in English. I am an ELL person. I get the pain and agony of that, but it is what it is. Um, we're testing their ability to do things in English. They probably have skills in another language. I totally respect that. But it is an English exam, especially for literacy. Like Asking them what those sounds say and they're using a different language wouldn't actually represent the language they're being assessed in. So um, my background is EL, so I totally get the pain and passion around that. <laughs> OK, alternate assessment. Those that probably took the alternate at the beginning of the year will take the alternate keep. We call it the keep alt. There's a different test for that. It's on the website. Um, you'll probably know if your students took the keep alt. If not, check in with their special education person, see what they decided. Um, some kids took the regular keep, and then we're like, whoop, we're going to do the keep alt. And some tried the keep alt, and they're like, well, I think they could do the keep. So it just depends on what they had. If they had one at the beginning, most likely they'll do the same one at the end. But if the kid made progress, and they're like, we want to do the regular keep, that's totally fine too, right, Trace? There's no problem in that. It's where the kid is in terms of what test to give. Is there a question here? I heard a little little combo. No? OK. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Just making sure. Um, oh. No, please, let me hand it off to Trace. <laughs> Um, the Keep Alt is for students with significant cognitive disabilities. It is not for students that are just struggling. Okay, so just remember that. Um, get with your special ed people, and it should be um, should be designated in their IEP how they're taking the Keep. I would assume somewhere along the line, IEP teams have done that this year, um, and you probably have some designated accommodations that IEP teams have have gone ahead and and put in there. 
this year. So if you do have questions around what that looks like, what it looks like in IEPs, please get in touch with me. Okay. Tracy Gooley. Yep. All right. In your student materials, you may have noticed we didn't get all the way through it as we went through today. There are a couple of documents that have an accommodated version. So for example, question number two, it'll say use the accommodated page for this particular student. Those are in the back of your booklet. There's three, I, I think two or three items that have an accommodated page if the kid has a certain um, disability and it's referenced in the manual. <laughs> It would be an IEP team decision, but absolutely. There's nothing that says they have to take the same one. Just talk with the team and make that decision. Because <laughs> um, sometimes at the beginning of the year of kindergarten, you have no idea what you're dealing with. <laughs> like, it's always a surprise. And I hate to call it the regular keep. I don't know. What, it's like keep and keep all. Because it's not like the kid's not regular. They just need a different type of test. So, <laughs> But we have a yeah, general assessment might be the way. Because I call it the regular keep, too. And I'm like, I always feel bad. I'm like, it's not like they're not regular. They're just not taking the keep keep. They're taking the keep all. <laughs> All right, these are your future question contacts. So when we email out the PowerPoint and you're like, who do I ask? You go to the last slide in the PowerPoint and pick the top two names. That is Liz and Heather. <laughs> All the rest of us are on there, but Liz and Heather are more personally dedicated to this in terms of Liz is our kindergarten specialist, so obviously this is where she spends her day. And then Heather is our elementary ELA assessment specialist, and probably Whitney we could probably blame too for math questions. Um, top two people on this side. Uh, but in terms of if you're like, I just need an answer, feel free to email all of us and we'll hit reply all and one of us will answer you, whatever works for your structure. I would suggest going to your district people or your charter people first if you have someone who has knowledge, because I guarantee they've had the question already and they can answer it more quickly. We're not always with our computers, like today, we've been with you for two hours. I guarantee I got some emails in the meantime, <laughs> right? So just know, like, we'll respond pretty readily, but your district people will know a lot of the answers because they're going to experience them from people like yourselves. So they'll be, um, you may not know who that person is. That's generally more the issue. So I would spend the next month figuring out who that person is. Because <laughs> your district, I'm sure, has someone assigned to this work. <laughs> All right. So there are your future questions. Feel free to contact us. What you'll get from me is a PowerPoint, what you saw today as well as the recording link. They'll probably come out separately because the recording link I'll probably get tomorrow, but we can send you out the PowerPoint today for those of you that have to train others. Um, but you'll get both of those eventually. You will have to just talk people through what the data base looks like. I can't send that link out. It's kind of still protected. But just sell it. Just be like, it's going to be awesome because it will. <laughs> All right, it's going to be way better than what they're used to. So. <laughs> I'm going to send it, if you came today through Midas and you're registered in Midas, we'll send it through there. And if you're added to the sheet because you didn't get to register, we'll just, as long as your email's on the sign-in sheet, we'll add you to the email. <laughs> All right, any other requests or questions as we close the day? We can send them electronically. And I think for like, when you do the books, if you just print out the books from the electronic version, then you don't get like the perforated edge or the, the curly cue. Like that's probably how I would do it, just like print it off. But... It's up to you. And they don't have to be color. If you don't have a color printer, don't go crying to your principal for a color printer. Like, just print it grayscale. It'll be fine. It's nothing about the color of the dog is in the story. It's fine. There's nothing color related. So, again, color blind kids wouldn't know the difference. So, it's fine. <laughs> okay. The new version. So, we got these this morning, well, last night from the prison. That's where we get all our materials. And so when we realized the student materials were erroneous, they're fixing them. Our goal is to have all the materials in by the end of the month so we can disperse them to LEA. So if you ended up with a crappy version of the student materials, which all of you did today, because they're upside down, <laughs> um, the teacher manual is as good as it's going to get this year. We found errors every single time we look at it. So we'll continue to refine it. But for example, entry. You guys gave us a ton of feedback as a group on fixing the entry, and we've made those fixes. It will be coming out in the next couple of weeks as well. So just know we did respond to your feedback, and hopefully you'll notice some things like, yeah, I said that. <laughs> um, in that, so you can think the same thing. Keep exit. We'll come back for feedback and refinement, because we do the best with what we know at the moment, and then we learn, and we grow, and we adapt. And the only way we do that is through all of your voices. So please give that information to whoever makes sense. We'll have some ways to communicate that as well. But as you're giving the test, you're like, it'd be really nice if. 
feel free to send us an email. We keep a folder and then we go back when it's time to revise and we use that to kind of guide the revision. So if you're very passionate, you're like, this would have really helped if I had had this opportunity, then share that with us. We're open to it. This is just, we have administered it. We feel good about it, but you're going to give it to a, you know, 45,895 kids is how many were tested at the beginning of the year. You learn a lot from 45,000 children <laughs> rather than the sampling of like 80 that we did. So keep that in mind. We're happy to receive feedback and continue to improve just like you as teachers continue to try and improve your practice. So thank you for your time today. If you have any questions, feel free to stop by one of us on your way out and we'll get you the information via email. Thanks so much. <laughs>